2020, international chess professionals converge in St. Louis for the 2017 Fall Chess Classic. The Fall Chess Classic is over, and we have a champion. But it wasn't decided the normal way. We had to go to playoffs in what was a very exciting and long day. The final round of Group A saw all games end in draws, which meant that two players stood atop, Georg Meyer of Germany and St. Louis' own Yaroslav Zerebuk. Both players would have to engage in a playoff. The format for the playoff was two rapid games. That's game in 10 with a two second increment. If that series was tied one to one, they would play a best of two blitz series. That's five minutes with a two second increment. And if that was tied, well then they would have to go to a Blitz Armageddon. History was made here in Group A of the Fall Chess Classic for the first time in this classic series. We went to a playoff. There were two players at the top and guess who won? It's this guy, Grandmaster Georg Meyer, the champion of Group A. Congratulations on your playoff you. victory. I mean, I know the adrenaline's still flowing. How are you feeling right now? I'm just pleased with, with my performance. I mean, there, there was only one game in the whole tournament where I had huge regrets. That was when I didn't beat Narodetsky yesterday. But otherwise, things were going well, and mostly in the tiebreak, I was also playing well, except for one time where I got really low on time and got punished for that. Oh my gosh, and that, that, that third game, that was just nerves personified right there. But uh, let's, so the format, uh, first we had, we were guaranteed two rapid games, game in 10 with a two second increment. And if it wasn't decided there, then we go to blitz and well, we did. So uh, let's take a look at some of the moments starting in sequence with the first game. Yeah, well, especially in tiebreaks, I just stick to, to my very solid openings with knight f3, g3. Well, in the classical games, uh, I do mix it up a bit more. So we got some symmetrical Grinfeld, which I must have had hundreds of times also in Blitz. And eventually, after s exchanging some pieces, we got to this position, which is uh, about equal. So his point was that I cannot uh, hang on to my pawn on a4. Uh, sorry, bishop c4. I cannot hang on to the pawn on a4 because queen d7 is a sweet double attack against g4 and a4. So I decided just to bring my bishop into the game. And from here, Yaroslav started to, to lose the um, threat of the position. Because obviously this rook on a4 is actually standing quite awfully. Since, I mean, it cannot do anything against the structure with a3 and the bishop on b4. And he decided to put another rook <laughs> to the useless a file. And now I've found a nice way to get the initiative, opening up the position. And now I'm threatening to play rook c7, and it's quite hard to do anything about it. The computer is showing that the only defense is queen takes c7, which I didn't really consider, but I also didn't have to. But instead, with the clock ticking down, Yaroslav uh, immediately panicked with g5. I saw some nice line with queen d4. And here black wants to take on f2, but actually I can liquidate into, I think, a winning rook endgame. Because my rook is uh, also going to sit on this b-pawn, so that black is completely tied down. So after g5, basically uh, uh, one on the spot since now I'm on the 7th rank and he has a weakness on f4 and no, no coordination to speak of. So I think the position is just lost and here he resigned. So that of course was a great start for me. And now Yaro was forced into a must-win situation. You can't draw or else you get the victory, the match victory um, and the tournament. So let's take a look at game two. Yeah, and this was kind of fun. He played a3, and then I thought for a moment, and I thought, okay, let's play white again. Knight f6, uh, g6, and I do what I usually do. So I think he, he just wanted to get a random position to make me think. 
so that later on in time travel he could hope for some chances and this is pretty much what happened although I think I, I was positionally just winning and up on the clock and then if I hadn't fallen asleep then I, I should wrap up the match here but okay it's a tie break and such things happen so here I'm already positionally better with firm control of a dark squares in the center and I just decided to play very safely not to force any matters and yeah this is just a, uh, an extremely pleasant position with no weaknesses for black great pieces and even the a pawn that is quite weak so here I I, I basically missed his, uh, his rejoinder I should just play queen e7 then rook a8 and he has no active ideas at all instead I played knight before. I basically thought that I'm already closing out the game, attacking on d3, but he found this very nice trick, knight b5. And now if I take on d3, I actually don't manage to, to salvage the material. Everything is under attack. So I went back, losing two tempi, and now, of course, he, he gets a little bit of play, although I still have a decent position. And okay, so we continue like this. And now we were down to soon seconds. And I'm still posi positionally almost winning, but I mean, he, he, he's at least looking at my king. And then in time trouble, I just collapsed. So here, uh, rook a4, I literally played with one second remaining on the clock. And the next moves we, we played instantly, and then I resigned. And we of uh, Queen G7, Rook takes a fat mate. The tension in the room when that happened yeah. was um, was so high. It was like, oh my goodness. So Yarrow did it, and he forced uh, a guaranteed two uh, two game blitz match. So the match continued. Yeah, but I mean, I, I wasn't really shaken. I was. You know, just upset at, at falling asleep with a good position, but I'm a very good blitz player, so I wasn't worried at all about my chances. Right. And and Yaro's attitude was very much of relief in the room. He was wiping his brow like, <laughs> yeah. And it's basically, in the blitz, I changed a little bit my attitude because seeing what happened in that last game, I decided to play. I, I must play quickly and practically and not look for the best move too often. Just play solidly and wait for my chances. So here we had some queen's gambit and got some normal position. And well, here already something went wrong for him because after queen d5 he cannot move the f pawn. I have this cute trick and I just win two pawns for nothing. So he had to go back. Of course I equalized very comfortably. But here I, I basically missed this bishop a6 and I cannot take on f3 because my my rook will be trapped. Now the c8 rook has nowhere to go. So like I said, I didn't mind. Just go back. Don't waste too much time <laughs> thinking about what I did wrong. And still, back is extremely solid. Probably not better, but I like that I have the more compact pawn structure and especially in a blitz game that that means it's easier for me to play. So I, I was trying to exchange pieces. And now uh, he, he allowed me. And white is settled with some weaknesses now. E5, C4, even A2. And at least practically speaking, I very much like black's position here because the knight is trying to go to F5. And then I can just uh, start um, eyeing the C4 pawn. So now I attack c4 and already white has very bad coordination. And here I was thinking if I should take on g3 and ba basically he's forced uh, to take with the pawn, with a bad pawn structure, to keep c4 protected. But I realized that his coordination is so awful that I should just exchange the queens and then I can start picking up pawns on the queen side. So I played queen d7 and now it was very easy. So he <laughs> he was desperate enough to even allow me to take on e3 just so that he gets rid of the knight, but 
it's too much here. Because now with every move I will attack his weak pawns. And basically I, I picked them all up here, this one even with check and soon he resigned. So that, that was a very uh, confident victory I think. And that brings us to the last game. And once again, Jarl finds himself in a yeah. must-win situation to force an Armageddon. So he was struggling to find some setup again to, to make me think a little. But I'm very experienced uh, with the system, especially in Blitz. So I usually have some idea what to do quickly. So he's trying not to have any tension in the center, just to be flexible. But e eventually he'll run out of moves, because if he continues like this, then I will have e5 and potentially e6 coming, disrupting his, his whole king side. Played c5, which is positionally quite ugly, since now all the queen side uh, is full of faults for black. Yeah, and here um, white is just comfortably better. And even with logical moves, uh, I'm trading pieces. Okay, I was not trying to prove any advantage, but I saw that here I'm very safe and just went for this. And here, I think his only chance was to play queen f7 here. Because he has kind of a double attack, attacking d5 and threatening to take over the e-file. And I wasn't yet sure what, what I would do here. But obviously not, not much is happening still, I mean, no, not this. Even if I allow him to play rook e8, I can still do this. Since he can't really take the pawn on d5. Because I have queen e7 check at the end and now he has to give me a pawn back. And with his open king there is simply nothing he can do in terms of playing for a win. And he played queen f7 and now I could immediately shut down the game with rook e6. So if he would take on d5, I uh, just take on d6. And here, obviously white is just better with the pass pawn on e6. But my objective was simply to, to make a draw from here, just to be solid. And that was not too difficult. Now it's basically over because whole pawn structure is fixed and there is no way he can approach my e6 pawn. And well, we made some moves, but here <laughs> I, I was happy to just force a draw, but I, I could also play e7 and force him to resign on the spot, but at that point it doesn't matter. Mercy, he said. Two and a half to one and a half, but it's enough. It's enough to win the Fall Classic on tie breaks, or on uh, playoffs, rather. So, Georg, I know that you're, uh, you're all out and about in the chess world. Where can the people find you on the internet? Uh, I did start a Twitter account not so long ago. So if you put my name, you'll find me. Hopefully, I will start tweeting a bit more. And I used to play a lot on chess.com, online blitz. Now recently not so much, but usually people will see me there every now and then. But the website I don't have so far. I imagine that you are playing in, uh, are you playing in the Spice Cup? No. No? What's, what's coming up next for you in the chess world then? Uh, actually tomorrow I fly to Uruguay where the World Championships under 14 to under 18 are taking place. And for the first time I'm gonna coach some German youngsters there. And incidentally, Uruguay is the, the home of my mom, so I've been there many times and I was happy to have the opportunity to basically go back there since I haven't been for six years. Very cool. Well, good luck with that. I appreciate you joining me. Let's go to dinner. It's uh, Grandmaster from Germany, Georg Meyer, the champion of the 2017 Fall Classic. Third place is Poland's Darius Spirits from SLU who scored five out of nine, he walks away with $3,000. Second place, oh, so close, he just lost in the playoffs. Also from SLU, it's Jaro Zerabuk, five and a half out of nine. And after playoffs, he is the undisputed champion of the Fall Classic from Germany, Georg Meyer. Meyer walks away with the top prize, $6,000.
While Group A went all day, Group B couldn't have been more of the opposite. In fact, Josh Friedel put the nail in the coffin early on and clinched the entire section early. The first game that ended all day, he won with Black against Angel Arebus. Group B's gold, silver, and bronze. Here we go. Tied for second and third place are Alan Pichet of Argentina and Antonios Pavlidis of Greece. They will split the second and third prize of $2,500 and $2,000 respectively. Both players scored six points, an excellent showing, and both were at the top of the leaderboard the entire time. And the Group B champion clinched it quite early. It's Grandmaster Josh Friedel one of the frequent chess club competitors and a veteran of the U.S. championships. He finishes with six and a half points and leaves with a nice four G's. Group B was over quite quickly because Grandmaster Josh Friedel needed a win and he got it against Grandmaster Angel Arebus. Josh, congratulations on your Group B victory. It's great to have you back in the studio. Um, what were your thoughts coming into today's game? Uh, well, it's a nice situation to be in because I'm um, half a point ahead and um, Angel is a very strong player, but he's struggling this tournament and so I, I figured I would play solidly, but at the same time, I really didn't feel like playing a playoff. Yeah. So I would definitely look for my chances and uh, fortunately for me, he walked into some analysis and ended up with a very bad position right away. Show us what went wrong for Arebus. Um, so he played the scotch, which he... He does, and I saw he played this move once, so it was one of many things he plays. Um, d5, and then queen e2 is kind of a new trend. So uh, I looked at this d takes e4 move. Bishop takes e4 is possible also, but then um, you can simply take the bishop and go to an end game with two bishops. Um, and okay, your pawns are crippled, but I think black's doing just fine here. So knight c3 is what they do, bishop b4, bishop takes e4. So in this position, I could have played bishop takes c3, takes e4, queen e7, and it's basically almost dead equal. But I thought that this move was more interesting uh, when I analyzed it. And again, I don't think it necessarily changes the evaluation, but it's uh, a more interesting move. So he takes on c6, which you pretty much have to do, rook b8, and this is where things went wrong. So um, castles, I think, is the best move, uh, and then black continues with queen d6 with ideas of hitting the bishop. If the bishop moves the wrong way, you have bishop a6, and knight g4 comes. It's kind of an interesting position, I think. Um, but black definitely has compensation with the pawn. Um, he played bishop e3, which is, looks very natural. Um, but after knight g4, I think white's just in huge trouble because white can't castle here because of queen d6 uh, hitting the bishop and threatening mates. And he follows up by taking on a7, which is his idea, but after queen f6, just way too much is hanging. Bishop's hanging, knight's hanging with check, and then he loses the rook. Um, if he tries queen e4 check here, I have queen e5 check. And this is the reason I didn't take first, because now, after bishop e4, and this may not be necessary, but I thought if I'd taken first, he could play bishop d4. Whereas here, I think he's just, um, just losing, because if a bishop goes back all the way, I take this guy and... This is going to be bad news here. Check. Takes it to, I mean, it's just over. Um, so he did what was very natural. He castled queenside, which is probably his best option. Um, but after takes, takes, queen takes c6, and I take on c3, he's really pressed for moves. Um, he played queen e7, which was a bit unexpected. I thought he would try queen d3. And then my plan, I believe, was to play... And I, I should say that I didn't remember my analysis on this particular line, so I had to figure this out, so of course things could be wrong, but my idea was to check. Of course I don't want to trade queens. Uh, and then queen e5. I was debating between queen e5 and uh, some other move, but I like queen e5, and the idea is that if allowed, I'm going to play knight takes f2 simply, um, and I'm also keeping the bishop from getting back in the game. It can't go to a7 because of queen a5 check. Um, so I thought something like rook e1, queen f4 check, and even just takes on f2, and I thought that this was um, rather promising uh, for black. But again, I, I wasn't 100% sure during the game. Um, he played queen e7, and then after bishop f5, uh, I could play check and try to go back, but I thought it was less clear than what I did. I just grabbed this pawn, very boring, but 
I'm just going to take one of his rooks. Um, bishop e6 was maybe also possible. Um, but I didn't see like a clear win. I should just show this quickly. After rook d8, it looks ridiculous, but I didn't see a win here. So uh, I can obviously check till the end, but I didn't see a win. So I went for this, and we ended up trading to an endgame where I think um, you know it looks like my knight is is trapped. But the problem is I can always get it out by advancing my pawns, and I, I can even leave it there for a long time because white can never take it. And just advance my king, start taking pawns, eventually just push. And um, Obviously, he could have played this out more, but he decided to uh, call it quits here. Well, Josh, I, you know, you work efficiently. You work quickly in the final day. Um, so that's, that's nice, and like you said, no playoffs. Uh, what's next for you on your chess calendar? Um, I don't have too much for the fall. Um, I played quite a bit, a lot over the summer, at least for me. Um, but uh, my plan was to play in Mexico in December, so hopefully that'll work out. Um, I, you know, always wanted to play there, and that's basically my next major tournament. So, sounds good. Four thousand dollars richer, the Group B champion of the Fall Classic, Josh Friedel. Thank you very much for joining me. It's been one heck of a tournament. Here is the total prize breakdown for both fields. Keep in mind, besides first place, if any two or more players tied, they would add up those respective places prizes and then divide it by the number of people tied. It's that simple. And that's gonna do it for the Fall Chess Classic, the final of this series in 2017. And we hope that you join us next year for the 2018 Winter Classic when we do it all over again. We hope you enjoyed meeting some of the new players, 2300 through 2600, maybe you haven't met before, maybe you wanted to know more about. And these personalities, you can bet, are going to be on the scene more and more as time goes on. So thank you for joining me, Ben Simon, and the St. Louis Chess Club for the 2017 Fall Chess Classic. So long from the Show Me Stake.